Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Alexander Haltner. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, something called property-based testing uh, and I'm gonna be using Python but the concepts should apply to other languages as well uh, and you can also use Python to test other languages. I will show some examples for that. Uh, so um, let's just first, uh, how many here have used automated testing? I suppose uh, a lot of you. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, how many of you have used property-based testing? Uh, a few less. Okay. So uh, I've also noticed that not that it's not that common that people use property-based testing, but it's very interesting. So therefore, I'd like to shed some more light on it. Uh, and uh, I'll just start with. Uh, Presenting myself a little bit. My name is uh, Alexander Haltner. Uh, I run my own company called Haltner Technologies. Uh, I mainly do uh, consulting and product development uh, in software. Uh, you can contact me at Twitter at a at a Haltner uh, or email me at contact at Haltner.se. Uh, my website is Haltner.se. Uh, all the slides. Uh, will be available on, actually there's a spelling mistake there I see, but it's on slides.com slash Haltner. I will tweet it out uh, as well later and I will put all the content on my GitHub as well, which is, uh, uh, my name is just Haltner there as well. Uh, so uh, if you want to go back and uh, retrieve links, so you don't have to note them now, just uh, check my Twitter or uh, whatever, and you will find the slides and uh, get everything from there. Uh, yeah, so uh, let's start. So a basic outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, first, what is property-based testing and why should we use it? Uh, a short sheet sheet uh, where I just uh, cover some of the most important things. So if you're gonna fall asleep, uh, just listen to those two minutes at least. Uh, then I'm gonna be talking about the library called Hypothesis. It's a Python library, uh, which is very useful for building your uh, property strategies and building good tests. Uh, I'm gonna go through some usage examples get for getting started. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some more advanced strategies but I'm not gonna go into too much depth. Uh, it's more gonna be uh, like an introduction to property-based testing. Uh, I'm gonna mention rule state machines uh, because they are a very powerful concept, but I'm not gonna go into detail uh, because it's outside the scope of this talk. It would take under another day maybe to get through everything, but uh, I'm gonna have an interactive demo in uh, demo in Jupyter where I'm gonna show uh, how it could be used to find some subtle bugs in uh, software. And then a short conclusion and a Q&A uh, where I also will list all the links to find uh, the slides and other material. Uh, so what is property-based testing and uh, why should we use it? Let's start with uh, traditional unit tests. Oh, wrong. Uh, traditional unit tests. So they are usually based on specific examples and tend to have uh, a bit of repetition because usually you make a few tests testing, okay, what happens if I do it like this or this or have this input? Uh, and that also tends to lead to happy path testing where you test what you know should work, but maybe you don't try out all the edge cases which might actually break your application. Uh, with uh, property-based testing, you have another approach. Uh, you generate thousands of examples by specifying uh, the sort of input the, the application can take. So it's more about specifying the behavior and verifying that it actually works, as you said. Uh, and it can shrink these problems. Uh, what that means is that 
uh, it will try to trigger an error, but maybe it uses a very large input, and then it will try to uh, do a binary search to find exactly where the error happens. Uh, and in that way, it's much easier also to locate what might go wrong. Uh, it's very good at detecting subdob bugs. Uh, I've found stuff like uh, time zone conversions where it can drift uh, a couple of seconds between an application language and certain databases, for instance, which might not be noticeable very quickly, but if you do several round trips, it will eventually add up to days. So uh, those kind of things can be very hard to find otherwise. Uh, another example I've seen is where negative IDs does weird things uh, and can sometimes crash your application. Or in other cases, I've seen hash algorithms go crazy with negative IDs. Uh, and it's very useful as well for comparing implementations when doing refactorings or rewrites. Basically, you can throw uh, input to both your new implementation and to your old one and you know that you should get the same results consider if the old implementation works and you just want to refactor it to a more uh, nice state. Uh, so here's my quick cheat sheet. Uh, as I said, uh, it's about defining uh, input and behavior, not specific examples, although you can do that. Uh, if you want to uh, specifically try some things. Uh, and I recommend looking at QuickCheck by Jan Hughes. Uh, that's actually how I got introduced to it, uh, by actually taking a course here at Chalmers a few years back. And uh, um, I took the course because I'm, I'm a hobbyist Lisp hacker and wanted to try out Haskell. But uh, what was the greatest takeaway from it was probably property-based testing, uh, something I did not expect going into that course. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about Hypothesis, which is basically a port of QuickCheck to Python, but they have also added other concepts on top of that, making it easier to use and very powerful for a lot of stuff. Uh, here are some links to some other videos if you're uh, if you're thinking about using it. So Beyond Unit Tests is a talk at last year's PyCon by Hillel Wayne. Uh, he talks about uh, about hypothesis and uh, also how you can go beyond your unit tests. And there is also better testing with less code, an older PyCon talk, which also talks about hypothesis and property-based testing. Uh, this is a resource uh, choosing properties uh, based testing, uh, F-sharp. This is for the F-sharp uh, implementation of QuickCheck. I don't remember the name right now, but I think it's like F-check or something like that. Uh, but the things they mention in the article uh, rings true for all kinds of property based testing. So it's more about uh, how you should define your properties and develop good strategies to test your application. So I recommend reading it even if you're not using F sharp. Uh, okay, so Hypothesis. Um, it's a Python library. Uh, their website is hypothesis.works. Uh, they have some very neat stuff. Oh, my computer fell asleep. Uh, they, they have some uh, very nice, uh, neat stuff. And as I said uh, previously, it's based on uh, on QuickCheck, but they have added a lot more stuff. They have a very large library of what they call strategies. S uh, strategies are different ways of generating input. Some notable examples are DP contracts, uh, which is used for contract-driven uh, development. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, you can look into it. It's a very po powerful uh, concept where you define a contract for how your software should uh, behave. And you can use this as a formal way of uh, validating that your implementation actually works. So it's very, very good for that mission-critical code which can't go wrong. 
Uh, I'm not going to cover that too much today, but it's very worth looking at if you're interesting interested in that. Uh, Swagger conformance testing, that's a very interesting one. You can basically throw a Swagger spec to Hypothesis, and it can then uh, run tests towards this uh, API. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Swagger is, I think it's actually named OpenAPI now, but the UI is still named Swagger. Uh, and uh, this implementation strat of the strategy is also named that. Uh, but basically, it will take the specification of the API and it will look at the sort of input the API should handle and it will just generate a lot of cases out of that and try to break your implementation. Usually, you can find some uh, fun errors that way. There are also uh, strategies for pandas, numpy, if you're doing data science stuff. There is for Django uh, models, if you're using Django. I, I haven't tried that one myself, but I've heard it's good. Uh, then we have rules, uh, which I talked a little bit before. It's uh, basically a way of defining state machines where you can uh, get steps to reproduce an error, so you don't actually define the test case. The library actually does the test case for you. You just say what the application can do. Um, and here is a minimal usage example. Uh, in this case, we want to generate two positional arguments. You can use keyword arguments as well. So we have two integers, and we want to check that they are commutative. So we want to see that x plus y always is the same as y plus x. So this is a very simple test, but it's one of the basic examples uh, from the hypothesis documents, and I think it showcases how easy it can be to actually get started with it. So this is just a PyTest test, and you just define some inputs, and then what those should be. Uh, you can use other strategies. There are for lists, there are for tuples and floats, and there are third-party strategies for about everything you can think of, and if there aren't, you can probably define w one yourself. Uh, you can also pass them some more stuff to uh, customize the behavior. I will talk a little bit more about that in another slide. Uh, so shrinking errors. Uh, I talked about this. So uh, when you find an error, maybe, maybe you have some very large arbitrary input and you're not quite sure why it's breaking. So if you're using maybe just randomized data and not doing any shrinking, maybe you don't understand the problem. Um, but here's an example where we have shrunken an error. So I'm doing a test, uh, testing an add function, and I can see that if I'm throwing A minus one and B one to it, it's actually getting an error. The original failing test could have been something entirely different, but this was the smallest case it could find that still triggers the error. So this is kind of, if you go one up, it will not trigger the error anymore. So let's see what the buggy code looks like. Well, it's not that strange. Uh, we're looking if A is less than zero, then just return A, otherwise add them up. So obviously it's going to be buggy. but it's a good way to show how it actually found exactly the edge case where it breaks. Uh, and of course, once you've found this kind of error, you can use uh, examples. So this way, we have added an example uh, with the previously buggy version. And this way, we can ensure that we're not getting re regressions at a later point, because we know that with this example, Hypothesis will always test this case. And this is very useful if you already know some tricky cases for your application, or if you know you've had previous bugs which you don't want to reappear. Hypothesis will actually also store all bugs it encounters, uh, or all failures, in uh, your local database. But that's only on your machine or on the machine that's running the test, so it's not shared between all code and unless you've set it up in some way to do that. So using these examples are a very good way to explicitly show that always try this. 
so back to strategies. Uh, you saw the integers, but we have stuff like tuples and lists. You can also say how large the list should be. Maybe you don't want an infinite large list, or maybe you don't want empty lists. Uh, and sets, of course, as well. Y you have text, but you also have characters. You can also define which characters the text should use. So maybe if you're just trying ASCII, maybe you don't want the entire Unicode, or maybe you want the entire Unicode to see if you're breaking something with your encoding and decoding. Uh, you have floats and integers, and as you saw there, it also tries negative ones, but you can also say that it should only test positive ones if that's the only thing the function should support. Uh, and you have uh, date times, you have time zones. These are very useful. I've used them to test time conversion, ti stuff that does a lot of things with time where there can be subtle bugs sometimes. Very good if you're trying to build something that's creating, let's say, a calendar event and you want to serialize it and then, then deserialize it and verify that your library for parsing the calendar events actually works as it should. Uh, yeah, and you can narrow down these strategies using, for instance, max and min, like max length, min length, max size, min size, uh, max value, min s uh, value. But there are other things as well you can do. Le but if you want to see everything, you should look at the documentation. And here's a link you can click when you get the slides as well to see all the first and third party extensions. Of course, there are more fir third party extensions as well, but there is a lot of them. Uh, there are is a uh, neat API fuzzing example in the docs. This is not the Swagger conformance one. It's rather just, uh, yeah, it's a bit more general. It's just trying to get the server to throw in 500 by uh, running some uh, data towards an API. Uh, and of course, rules. So I'm not going to go into every detail of this, but it's very, very uh, neat. And uh, I think everyone should at least have heard about it. So if you want to uh, go further with your property-based testing, this is something you should look into. But this is a quote from Hypothesis, which says, with Hypothesis stateful testing, uh, Hypothesis instead tries to generate not just data, but entire tests. And I think that puts it quite uh, neatly. Basically, you, you define a state machine where you say uh, what your application can do, like add this item to cart, remove it from cart, uh, update prices, uh, yeah, whatever. And then hy Hypothesis will go in and it will try to do as much stuff as possible with your application until an error occurs. Once the error occurs, it will show you the actual steps it took to get the error. So you actually get the steps to reproduce, which you might not always get in your bug reports otherwise. So I think you should uh, look into this if you want to go further with your property-based testing. Uh, and now I'm going to show you a demo I put together in Jupyter Notebook with some more interactive examples. Uh, let's put this in presentation mode. Can you guys uh, see it? Is it uh, large enough? Yeah. So I have a case about a, a made up bank, Swebank. Uh, in this demo, um, I will use it to show some subtle bugs which we might be able to figure out. Uh, Swebank are very confident in their software and they have 100% line coverage, so they are sure that everything is great, but somehow they are still having problems, so they're not sure why. Uh, and here's an example of one algorithm they are having problems with. So they have a stock market, and on the stock market it's illegal to buy stocks from and uh, to yourself, because then you could manipulate the prices. Uh, so, in their matching algorithm, they actually look who's the buyer and seller, but they want you to buy it from their own bank customers if they can, because then they don't have to pay the fees to another bank. So, 
they they're trying to find a matching buyer that is not yourself but from the same bank if they can't find that they will look in the other banks as well so they have this a simple function which takes in a stock ticker a buyer and a list of sellers so you have the buy order and the sell orders it's basically a customer uh, id string and a price what they do is that they uh, look for the price and seller in all the sellers and if the price matches the buyer price and the seller uh, um, bank uh, ID uh, so uh, this is maybe not the most beautiful implementation but the first three letters are the bank's uh, uh, ID basically so by looking if it's B and K, K then it's Swebank but if it's or VL then is the rival bank which they don't want to trade with if they don't have to uh, and then they also check that the seller is not the same as the buyer if they find a match they will return that uh, but if they can't they will look in all the sellers and see if there is a match uh, and if they can't find any match at all then they return none because the trade can't be uh, executed so Swebank have quite fair testing. They have actually uh, uh, broken it out. So they don't have just cases for everything. They actually have some different cases test data and have parameters for trying out it. And uh, they also have a list of some different sellers. Uh, they have 100% line coverage and they are confident in their solution. So they are not sure why they are having these problems. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you can spot the bug right now. And no worries if you can't, it's quite subtle. If you can, then it's uh, extra points for you. Uh, but there is a bug in this code. Maybe it's not the most pretty code, but it's bank software. So what do you expect? <laughs> uh, so here we can see um Swebank running their tests and we can see that they assert that the winner uh, uh that if the, there isn't a winner there's no price that matches the buyer price and if there is a winner it's not the buyer uh and that the match prices uh also they check if the winner uh bank is not the same as the buyer bank then ensure that there is actually no uh, seller in the entire list of sellers that actually match their bank and they get a hundred percent complete with full coverage so it looks like everything is fine but since they are having problems they hired me from Hautner Technologies to see if there's room uh, to improve their testing and of course we will use property-based testing to see if we can find some problems so we define a, con uh, a customer uh, it's basically a string of text that's at least four characters because it's at least a bank identifier and some kind of ID. And for orders, it's a customer and a price. Then we generate a list of orders and a buy order. Uh, we give this to our test trade function, which we have simplified a little bit, but it's heavily based on the one Swebank had uh, previously because it's a it's a quite good verifier, so we don't have to do a lot to actually adopt their tests to the property-based solution. Basically, we just have to give this decorator and make sure they actually take in sellers as a parameter as well. Then we run our match by, and we do the same sorts of asserts. Uh, and now let's run this and see. Oh, there's a failure. So let's see what's happening. While running the tests, we can see that if you have the buyer uh, quadruple zero, so from bank zero, 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 ID zero, it will actually match a, sell, a seller, which is the same person with the same price. So this in, is an illegal trade with yourself. Um, and yeah, we can also see the exact falsifying uh, example here. So it has shrunken the error to the minimal case it can find. So what does this why does this happen? Well, this is because they're checking identity, not the quality. Uh, in Python, if you have a short string or a simple string, they will use the same place 
or at least in the C Python implementation, the same space in memory. So they will have the same identity. But if the string grows or if it has some special characters, it will not use the same space in memory. Then it will not have the same identity, but it will be equal. So here you can see bonk uh, bang will not match bonk bang because it will not use the same space in memory. Uh, so basically this row is the problem. Uh, seller is not buyer can actually evaluate it true even though it's the same person because it's just checking the identity. Uh, it's quite easily fixed. We just use not equals instead of is not in two places. Of course, they should have broken this uh, logic out to a common function, but that's another step. Uh, let's just see if we can fix it for now. So we run our test again, and you can see it's not allowing the illegal trades anymore. So with these learnings, uh, the Swebonk uh, engineers started to look at another problem they were having. They had another part of their business where something illegal was happening. Uh, namely some money laundering protection. Uh, I'm not sure what's happening here. So do not tell me that, uh, do not tell them that I showed you this software because it's top secret, only enterprise software with security clearance. So this money laundry protection is actually a little bit simpler than the previous one, but it's still bank software. Uh, basically they are looking for bad accounts in a blacklist if it matches the blacklist, then it will not allow the transfer to go through. So basically, you should not be able to transfer money laundered money into this web bank. Uh, but they are having problems. So they tried the same approaches and did a list of transactions and tried it towards a list of blacklist. And sure enough, they had the same problem with some special characters in the account name, or with a longer account name, it would allow blacklisted uh, accounts to actually do transfers to Swebonk. So, of course, they allowed illegal trades. They just didn't know it because they had 100% line coverage, so they thought their code was secure and safe. Uh, and thanks to this, they could actually quickly try to Im improve their implementation and actually made it more Pythonic in the way. Now they're just checking if account is not in the blacklist. And it's actually working. So there you have it. That's how Swebonk could improve their software using property-based testing in some simple cases. Okay, so I hope you like the demo. Uh, it's not a real bank, but it could be any bank. Uh, conclusion, uh, you can write more uh, extensive tests much faster. You don't have to define every test case. Uh, you can find much more bugs and you can uh, crush them. Uh, it's not a silver bullet for all testing. Of course, you will have some, some real uh, examples and you will have some traditional unit tests as well, but it's a very powerful tool in your belt and you should use it to make your testing better. Uh, and you should think about defining properties, not specific examples. So my recommendation would be just start playing with it. Just try it out and see how it works because it's often simpler than most people think. And if you have any further questions, you can uh, take them now if we have time. Otherwise, send, uh, send them to me at Twitter or via email or via any other channel. And if you want to learn more, you can contact me as well. I'm available for training or workshops or consulting at your companies. Uh, yeah, and that's everything for me. Thank you. Oh yeah, uh, do grab a business card from me on the way out if you want to talk with me more. Thank you. Uh, I'm just curious to see, if couldn't you just implement uh, unit tests using examples in uh, hypotheses? Uh, sorry, the question was you you uh, wanted to know if you could implement examples with uh, unit tests in no, hypo the, or the opposite. Uh, aren't they more or less the same thing? Uh, examples are basically yeah, like defining some like some traditional unit tests. So you could use it this way. 
But usually, if you have a very large suite of tests, maybe you don't want to run them every time with the entire hypothesis library because generating all these examples could take some time and maybe you want to do it faster, but in your maybe your CI system or something, you actually want to run the full suite and the full set of input. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Is, is this similar to first seed testing? Sorry. First seed testing, is that like a different? Fuzzy? Uh, fuzzy, yeah, fuzzy. it's very similar. Uh, basically, fuzzy testing is kind of an unstructured way of doing property based testing. So, there are fuzzing tools today which do some clever intro, uh, introspection to the code and actually tries to trigger as many branches as possible, like AFL. Uh, but it's not still at the same level as defining the actual properties of the software. So, fuzzing is more about just throwing as much random input as possible and see what happens. And property-based testing is more like this is the way the protocol should behave and if you do something else, then something is wrong. Is that a good answer for you? Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, if not, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>